everyone. Pleasure to be here. Well, this has been a wonderful evening, and um, we're going to continue with our theme of unexpected connections, but with a twist. There is an optional follow-up action for you after the meeting here. So listen very carefully, take notes, right? So, unexpected connections, discovering new things we didn't know about and we were not impressed up finally. Arguably, unexpected connections lead to new knowledge, new experiences, and because knowledge is good, therefore unexpected connections are good. But there's a problem. The problem is the unexpected nature makes them serendipitous. That is, they happen by chance. Because of that, they happen unpredictably and they may happen slowly in many cases. Right? So now we have a problem. Do you see a problem here? We have a dichotomy. On one hand, we have something which is good and we want. On the other hand, we have no control over it. It happens when it happens and it usually happens slowly. I'm here to suggest that we can resolve that dichotomy. At least in some cases, we can resolve that dichotomy. Okay? We use the word serendipity. So let's see what, what that word is. Um, did anyone know that it was actually voted as one of the favorite words, or the favorite word in English language? It's, 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 a, it's a very, very cool word. Um, it means uh, the occurrence of events by chance, that's a key word, by chance, in a happy and beneficial way. Okay? Um, the word was introduced by Horace Walpole in a letter that he wrote to a colleague back in 1754. And it was a reference to an earlier book that talked about three princes in, an, in a region called Serendip. Serendip was the old Persian word for what today is, is called Sri Lanka. Okay? And according to the story, I'm just highly, highly, highly summarizing it, the three princes uh, traveled looking for something they didn't know exactly what they were looking for, and by chance they discovered cool things. Hence the word serendipity. Let's look at the real world example, not, not the story. Aspirin. We all know what aspirin is. It helps reduce pain and reduce fever. Chances are everyone here has taken it, right? Um, the patent was filed in uh, 1899 in Germany, and what you see here is the US patent that was followed a year later. Okay, so 1899, and it was for pain and fever, right? And then lots of things happened. Um, aspirin, by the way, is one of the medicines which has been studied the most. And a paper was published um, in uh, 1974 that discussed how aspirin can be used to prevent heart attacks. Now, let me pause here. Disclaimer. I am not a physician. And I'm not suggesting you go and start popping pills. Okay? This is a study reported in 1974 when reporting to. So if you think you need some medication, talk to your doctor. Don't, don't listen to me. So, how did they come up with that? Because aspirin's for pain. That's what we think about. That's the correlation aspirin pain. Well, um, chances are through studies, through observations, um, some physicians noticed that some of the patients that are taking aspirin on a regular basis were suffering from fewer um, heart attacks. So it became apparent and they studied and they studied more and eventually the paper was published. Now we have a potential way of preventing some heart attacks. And that's a good thing. And it is an unexpected connection because aspirin was not created to do anything with heart, right? So it's a great thing. But on this slide, we are looking at a big problem. Can anyone see the problem here? It took 75 years for that serendipitous discovery to present itself. 75 years. How many lives could have been saved in those 75 years? Given the fact that heart attack is probably about the number one killer, right? So, I would argue that um, unexpected connections isn't just about personal experiences, which is important. It's not just about profits in companies, which is important. It's actually about global impact. We can accelerate serendipity in some cases. In some cases. And we do that, I propose, using analytics. Okay. We basically start with a lot of data. A requirement. We analyze the data and we discover new insights. 
This is in the realm of people who know statistics and probability, artificial intelligence, data science, and later on I'm going to suggest we all can do this. One way or another, we all can do this, and that's the bottom line. Okay. Um, let me share with you not an aspirin type story, but something I was involved with, so I can speak first hand. So these are facts, not factoids. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not here to beat my drums, that's not the point, I just want to share some personal and professional experience. I happen to be the, uh, the primary inventor of this patent. Um, it was filed about uh, four days a century ago, mid-90s or so, and we called it autonomous knowledge discovery. Because back then the phrase data mining didn't exist, that was not in the nomenclature back then. We came up with this solution because we were working on an automotive problem. How to reduce pain defects when we make cars. So let's think about an assembly line. From one end, you have body panel to the vehicle coming in. They get painted, put together, the car is assembled, the vehicle comes out. In that process, pain can have some defects in it. There are some 40 plus types of defects and new ones that present themselves from time to time. And this happened to be a very expensive problem. So we were looking for a solution. We worked with the paint engineers in a certain assembly plant. We developed this solution, and then we took one month worth of data from that particular assembly line. We analyzed the data using this, uh, using this solution. We discovered 37 connections. Now, what are these connections? Our data was all kinds of variables that affect paint defects. So we started paint defect, which body panel it appears on, what uh, color paint was used, uh, what was the viscosity, the ambient temperature, the paint temperature, humidity, and the list goes on and on. There were several dozen parameters. So putting them all together, we found 37 different, uh, different connections. We shared them with the, with the paint experts. We were told 30 of them were correct but known. Well, we felt good about that. We, we, we did things right. But it was of no value because they knew it. One of them was said to be nonsensical. So there was evidence in data, but it was only in data, had no basis in reality. Interestingly, six of them were reviewed by the experts, and the experts said, these are very plausible, but I didn't know about them. I've never thought about them in those terms. That's when we said, great, we, we've made some, some value here. So something of value was discovered during this process. We ended up using this solution a number of times, and another one that to mention to you, which is, I think, more interesting than a paint one, is a few years later, we were looking into a vehicle safety problem, in particular dealing with vehicle rollovers, under what conditions vehicles roll over and what we can do to make vehicles safer. So, we took data from uh, government, uh, NTSB, uh, National Highway and Traffic Safety, the, the, those guys of authority data, and we were analyzing them using, using them to identify the causes of uh, rollovers. In that process, our request was vehicle rollovers. Anything else we were not looking for. But what appeared to us was that the safest driving speed is 65 miles per hour, in, at which there are fewest number of traffic incidents, fewest number of accidents, fewest number of injuries, fewest number of fatalities. 65 miles per hour. Pause. Disclaimer number two. Don't go out there and drive 65 miles per hour wherever you go, because you will get a ticket, and if you go to in front of the judge and say, well, TEDx speech said, hey, it's the safest thing, that will not be a valid legal argument. You will lose that case, okay? The value of this is discovering something we didn't know before. And there are other authorities that can use this kind of information to perhaps make changes in the traffic laws, traffic patterns, so that the roads are safer for all of us. This was a truly unexpected uh, connection that was, uh, that was identified. Now, if we do get to do what we were just talking about, uh, life will not necessarily be rosy. This is not fancy. Okay? We have to be careful. What we have to be careful with is when we analyze data, we only discover correlations. Right? Only discover correlations. And correlation is not equal to causality. Causality requires a scientific process, proof, empirical data. We have to prove that the correlation is actually correct. Uh, just, just for fun, let's look at some spurious correlations. Okay. So, this particular chart, and you see the uh, the link where the uh, raw data is uh, is provided. 
The red line is the number of people who drown by falling in swimming pools. The black lines are films released for the Nicholas Cage of the Earth. It's over a period of time, right? I, I, I for one, refuse to believe that there is a correlation between the number of people who jump into the pools to die and the films of the uh, certain actor. Great actor, but I don't think this connection is, uh, has causality uh, behind it. Another one which is uh, equally interesting is um, worldwide non commercial space launches being correlated with sociology doctors of work. Okay? This is over a period of time. I, I really don't know what happens before and after, okay? but during this period, which is what, about 13 years or so, the correlation is, is presenting itself. Now, when we study this, this subject, we also look back and see if there are some hidden connections. But on the surface, I don't believe that NASA says, OK, let's see how many uh, social reductions we've awarded, and that will determine our flight flight plans for this year. That, that, that does not happen. I'm also going to tell you that what we just talked about is highly doable. Our students are doing it, some of them actually sitting amongst you. I happen to teach a course called Engineering for Voting Statistics, and uh, we want this course to be as pragmatic as possible, as useful for engineers as possible. So we have a project, and it's a very significant project. It takes about two and a half months, and a team of four, four students. They are asked to identify a particular problem they want to solve. They have to obtain real-world authoritative data. They need to come up with five questions that they need to answer using the data and two hypotheses to test. So this is required. This is the quest for this project. But in addition to doing all of this, they also get graded for discovering insights. Come up with something that they have not asked. So this is where the unexpected connection comes. And I'm very proud of my students. They all have been doing a great job. I'm going to share some of their findings with you. Um, the disclaimer that goes with all of these is that these are correlations. It's the work done in, in, a, in a junior or senior level class. Uh, it has not been peer reviewed. It has not been scientifically validated. But keep in mind that the students didn't know what you're about to see. They discovered these using a process that they, that they followed. Uh, a number of airlines related projects, uh, one of them said that, the, um, that if we warn pilots about um, bird strikes, that does not affect the likelihood of having bird strikes. So telling pilots that the birds flying around the airport doesn't increase or decrease the chances of having birds. This actually has some safety implications because we need to find a better way, something different. It was also seen that the design, the engineering of an aircraft, plays a lesser role in terms of avoiding uh, aircraft accidents than human error. By far. It's that by far that's the upper board there. Okay? Now, perhaps to the folks in the airline industry, this is known. But to our students, these were unknown. And they were, they were discovering this as they were going along. And this is in addition to the questions and hypotheses that they had. We had a number of projects that dealt with health and healthcare. One observation was that Hawaii has the highest life expectancy and they have the highest um, air quality index. Are they already moved to Hawaii? Yeah. We live on here. Um, developed countries have higher uh, incidence of anxiety. Um, yeah, that, that kind of might make sense, but. Uh, developed countries spend more per capita on healthcare but suffer from more health issues. This is an interesting one. This is worth studying. Is this just the correlations, the barriers, or is there some basis behind it? So this is worth looking into. The next one is our controversial slide. So here we are not making any statement about the subject. We are only presenting it as discovering correlations and insights from data. Okay, so please don't judge this slide. The students were examining um, crimes in the US. That, that's a very popular topic that, that the students choose. And so uh, well, they answer their questions. In addition, among the insights, they found that there is lower gun ownership in warmer regions of the US. Why? I mean, is it 
experience? Is there a basis for it? Are there other sociological factors that, that, that may be behind this? It's beyond the scope of what the student's doing class, okay? but it was, a, it was an interesting finding. It's certainly not known to the students. High gun ownership correlated with higher safety. I let other people deal with the implications of that. I'm just reporting the data. I'm a master threat, don't shoot me. Uh, vehicle safety was a popular topic. We've had more vehicle safety projects than anything else. Uh, light trucks are more likely to be involved in fatal car accidents. Think about that. When two vehicles crash, or when vehicles crash, we think about two vehicles hitting one another. But in reality, most vehicle crashes, according to this study, were single vehicle. Again, studying this may have some very significant uh, safety impact. Um, more fatal crashes occur when the weather is nice and sunny. This is possibly explainable, okay, but still interesting. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a thought-provoking question. This is an interesting car chart. It's all the projects that students have done. You've seen just a few examples. There's a lot more of these, and I'm really proud of my students because uh, they've done great work, and they've given me some good slides to work with here, right? Um, what this slide really shows is the breadth of discoveries that can be made by analyzing data using analytics. So we're not limited to a few domains. As long as the data is out there, we can analyze. So in summary, um, we said unexpected connections are good, but they can happen unpredictably and slowly. And we suggested that analytics can help. Now, what can you do? Well, um, if you work for a company, you can write a compelling proposal and perhaps get funding and resources to do something like this that supports your passion or something that's right for your company, like some of the projects we saw, and get something going. On your own, what you may find, and you may be surprised, is that this stuff is not terribly <coughs> difficult. As long as we find the data and the transit, tools are available. Free tools are available. We can do this. This is doable. Okay? And if you still don't want to do it, amongst you and elsewhere, there are data scientists. There are people who can do this for you. You find data scientists to be very nice and friendly people, and they usually get very passionate about this kind of work. It's easy to collaborate with them. Okay? So please do that, and maybe together we can make the world a little better place. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much for listening to my time.